Um, so why should animal suffering cause you to reject the Christian God? Well, the reason is quite simple. Such a God is supposed to be all-powerful and all-loving, so he should want to stop suffering, and he should be able to. But he hasn't stopped suffering. Now, this, I'm sure, is a familiar argument. But why focus on animal suffering? Well, the Christians think they have good responses to the standard problem of suffering. These are known as theodicies. But when we focus on non-human animals, which are simply called animals from now on, what we find is that these theodicies won't work. Now, I don't think they work with humans either, but let's set that aside for the moment. Let's think about one of the many ways in which animals suffer in the wild. Consider an animal wandering into a tar pit. What happens? Well, they get stuck and they die. Now, I want you to imagine yourself or maybe a loved one being stuck in a tar pit, unable to get out, probably starving to death. Pretty horrific, right? But the horrors have only just begun. What happens next is that other animals now see what they think is an easy meal, and then they get stuck too. At the La Brea tar pits in California, there are the remains of 4,000 direwolves that died in this way. Uh, no, direwolves are not just from Game of Thrones. And there were many other animals that died there too, and other tar pits, and of course many other horrendous ways that animals suffer in nature. Now one might of course wonder why didn't God give animals the instinct to avoid such horrible fates? It would be easy for God to do that, or for him to give predators analgesics um, in their teeth so that their prey suffer less. Now, John has mentioned elsewhere that some animals die quickly when consumed by a predator, but many others die slowly. It would be easy for God to make us all vegetarians. John, John has said this would not work, as grazing animals would consume too much grass and the ecosystem would collapse. But God could just lessen their appetite or give them more resources. How about photosynthetic skin? Christian philosopher Michael Murray has suggested that God might have given us infinite resources and then no one would have to die. But he also said that you know, infinite resources um, are impossible because we'd be squashed by their gravity. So modern physics has revealed why God could not have done this. But Murray is just wrong about physics. If you have an infinite amount of stuff in one direction, and it's balanced by an infinite amount of stuff in another direction, then the net gravitational force is zero. Um, and this isn't the only thing prominent Christian philosophers are wrong about, as we'll see. And why couldn't have God made us vegetarians? You know, we kill billions of animals per year for food, uh, which is causing one of the worst mass extinction events ever seen on the planet. God could stop this by disabling our ability to metabolize meat. Or maybe he could at least made bacon not taste quite so nice. Uh, you know, as one of God's chosen people, um, and as a vegetarian myself now, this is something I've really had to struggle with. Now, God has done none of these things. And I think the simplest explanation for that is that he doesn't exist. But let's go back to our tar pit example. How do the traditional theodicies fare? Well, one argument is that God, you know, favors free will. So he doesn't want to interfere with free will. But what's this to do with death by tar pit? Nothing. Tar pits form naturally. So this theodicy is not going to work. Another theodicy is that God allows suffering so that we can develop qualities like courage or forgiveness. Um, but in this case, the animals don't really have any way to rescue one another or themselves. So how is this relevant? Even if animals understand forgiveness, who are they going to forgive? Again, tar pits are a natural phenomenon. Now, elsewhere, John has said he's read dozens of Christian authors on this subject, and they explain suffering through Adam and Eve. Their sin brought death and suffering into the world. The humans were additionally punished by being uh, chucked out of the Garden of Eden, and the snake was punished by having it and all of its descendants have to crawl on their bellies. And as the British comedian Ricky Gervais said, this isn't much of a punishment for a snake, is it? And now, um, this sort of narrative is known as a full theodicy or Augustinian theodicy. But what St. Augustine didn't know, but we do, is that science has revealed to us that animals have been suffering for hundreds of millions of years before the first humans ever walked the earth. And this one simple fact totally undermines what John claims is the dominant Christian theodicy. What's more is that science has also shown us that other animals have a sort of proto-morality. And this strongly suggests that our right of our sense of right and wrong, like our physical bodies, has evolved. And this it wasn't something we got from eating a single piece of fruit tempted to us by a talking snake. Now, some Christians, like John, realize that the original full story that's actually in the book of Genesis won't work. 
Yeah, if only they had a chance to rewrite it. So they give us a second full story. You know what God meant to say. That is, before him has ever existed, Satan sinned. And this brought animal suffering into the world. It's a sort of prequel. And as we all know, prequels tend to be unsatisfying. And this explanation <laughs> is certainly that. Now, why isn't this in Genesis? I think John needs to explain why the Old Testament authors forgot to mention this incredibly important event. A further problem is that, again, science has shown us that we got here via a process of evolution. Evolution is cruel and nasty. As John has said on his blog, nature is a wandering, mindless, heartless, silent, stone-cold killer boss machine. Nature is a jerk. But according to Christianity, God is the author of nature. So what does that make him? And if catastrophic events like the impact that probably killed off the dinosaurs didn't happen, we most likely probably wouldn't be here. And this awful violence is the very engine of our creation. Now, if the fall of Satan is responsible for animal suffering before the fall, then that makes, well, that makes Satan the author of our creation. So this puts theologians in a terrible bind. They either have to, one, deny the science, or two, accept the science and give up the idea that God created us, or three, embrace the science, and, but that would give us a God that uses asteroid impacts and terrible violence to get to us, or four, claim that the cruelty of nature is down to the devil, but that makes the devil the author of our creation. So a further problem is that good designers build redundancy into their system. They allow for failure and make sure their systems won't go down as a result. Is that a video playing? Right. OK, but a world of perhaps trillions of organisms that all have to suffer because of the bad decisions of one or a few individuals, that shows no redundancy. What's more is that God is supposed to be able to see the future, so he knows that his system is going to fail, and yet he does nothing to stop it. This makes God to be a terribly bad designer or, or criminally negligent. Why didn't he just kill Satan? God kills lots of people all throughout the Bible. So why not Satan? Maybe he feels he needs a scapegoat to blame for all the suffering he fails to prevent. But animal suffering isn't limited to that which God refuses to prevent. He also commands great suffering. Consider 1 Samuel. God says, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, I found it very sad and very telling about the dark side of human nature that an intelligent and I'm sure educated person and caring person can give a justification for this genocide. But that's what theologians do all the time. Now, John has said that people massacred deserve what they got because they sinned against Israel. Now, let's put aside how this is supposed to apply to the children that were killed. How can it possibly apply to the animals? And if God had good reason to kill the animals, why not do so painlessly? Instead, he had his soldiers kill them with their swords. Let's give another example. In Joshua 11.6, we see that God commands Joshua to hoff their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now, I know nothing about horses, so I had to look up what this meant. And what to hoff means is to sever the Achilles tendon of the animal so as to immobilize it. Now, imagine what a horrific experience this is for the horse. If God is omnipotent, he could have immobilized them for the duration of the battle painlessly. He could have just broken the wheels of the chariots without harming the horses. But no, he chose this horrible torture. God also, of course, asked for animal sacrifices. Why? But the problem isn't limited to the suffering that God commands of others, but also includes the suffering that God directly inflicts on animals. When he killed the firstborn Egyptians, he didn't just limit it to the people, but also their animals. And the Bible gives us an explanation as to why he did this. He wants to show off his power. Consider the great flood. God kills almost every living thing on earth with a flood that lasts 40 days and nights. Presumably the weakest would have died first, mothers would watch their children being killed. Now God could have used a quick and painless method, but he didn't. And why did he carry out such an awful massacre? Because he was displeased with his creation. Now if it was just man's wickedness that displeased him, why kill all the animals? If God was displeased with the, the animals, why did he create them in the first place? And if this violence was necessary to wipe the slate clean, why save a pair of every animal? Because then you're just left with what you started with. So not only is his action brutal, but it's also pointless. After all, sin didn't go away, suffering didn't go away, violence didn't go away. The same animals that God nearly wiped out are now back. 
And if you think the New Testament is devoid of this brutality, consider the story where Jesus is involved with the exorcism of a demonic spirit. And, and I quote, um, the herd of pigs then ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. About 2,000 animals were killed according to the Gospel of Mark. Now why couldn't have Jesus exorcise evil spirits straight into the sea and skip the death of the pigs? Now in light of all these difficulties, theologians have been forced to more and more desperate measures. One strategy is called neo-Cartesianism, which is a view that animals don't really have morally significant suffering. Amazingly, this has been supported by prominent theologians such as C.S. Lewis, Peter Harrison, John Hick, and more recently Hick's former student, William Lane Craig. Craig is one of the more recent versions of this line of argument, so let's quote him about what he says about whether animals are aware of their pain. He says, for that sort of pain, awareness requires self-awareness. And this is centered in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, a section of the brain that is missing in all animals except for the higher primates and human beings. And therefore, even though animals are in pain, they aren't aware of it. This discovery magnifies the mercy and goodness of God. God has shielded almost the entire animal kingdom throughout its history from an awareness of being in pain. For those of us who are pet owners and lovers of animals, this is a tremendous comfort and a cause of praise of God for his goodness and wondrous, even ingenious, care of creation. Now, the technical term that philosophers use for this type of argument is that it is nonsense. Now, although John, John might not be a Neo-Cartesian, he has said human beings are distinguished from the rest of the animal kingdom in large part by their prefrontal cortex. Now, it's just not true that the prefrontal cortex is only found in higher primates. Here is an image from a textbook on the prefrontal cortex, and you'll see that other animals have them too. Ken Williford here has worked on a paper with neuroscientists who examined a patient with his prefrontal cortex effectively destroyed, and his self-awareness was perfectly intact. Moreover, his pain perception seemed worse than normal. So this line of argument is rendered completely dubious. The idea came from a clinical study of lobotomy patients that apparently said they didn't mind their pain. But of course, these patients had to be self-aware in order to say that. And when one looks at the details, it wasn't that they said they didn't mind pain, they did. It was their anxiety about their chronic pain which was lessened by the procedure. One reason we know this is that they, they still felt pain is that they said so, and they took analgesics for them. And animals do the same thing. They will give up their normal preferences in order to consume analgesics in a painful situation. Note that Bill Craig thinks that animals have been shielded from pain, something he thinks shows off the glory and ingenuity of God. And maybe it would if it were true, but it's not true. Animals haven't been shielded from pain, even though they could have been. And so what does that say about the glory and ingenuity of God? 